the for my approach to crypto, the last book that I wrote was about uh, had to do with the somehow with the blockchain and um, um, Bitcoin things. And my criticism of Bitcoin was, of course, that uh, as you're going to see here again um, in the in the in the realm of the art, that always when you have a new medium, the first usage of the new medium is the most of the time the most idiotic one. So when there was blockchain, it was used to emulate money, which is not really, it's a very old fashioned ritualistic, so to say, mode of behavior. And of course, if you think about money as such, money serves to distribute goods and allocate work. And it's very clear that from a media theoretical point of view, on the long run, these two things will not be governed by money. That was actually the last book that I wrote. So a, on a long run, we're going to go in the po into a post-monetary system of distribution, whether that be oligarchy, or oligarch friendly as we have it now, or the more equal as it should be, uh, is another question. But it's very clear that we have to think beyond money. And the same thing is the, with the crypt crypto, again, or whatever, I'm, I'm going to come to that, um, that of course the NF2, NFT, the use of blockchain and the use of blockchain for minting NFTs in the art world is emulating one of the most stupid rituals that art, the art world came up with. A ritual of ex exclusivity, as you pointed out just now. It's all about exclusion. Mm. Um, and one has to think beyond that in order to find a way to maybe use blockchain for a reasonable way. I'm, I'm, I'm not so, so much a friend of blockchain. I think most of the blockchain ac activities can be replaced by Excel sheets and democratically governed institutions, <laughs> but that's up for discussion. Um, okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm having a little bit of more um, art historical approach, and I start from the bottom of that list. Most of the people don't know what the term artist came from, and it comes from, a, so to say, a very early neoliberal revolution, if you want to say. And it was against the guilds. You mentioned guilds at some point, that the guilds were too expensive. They weren't actually. Art was more expensive. And that was the whole purpose of the thing. Um, I try to cut the, the story very, very short. Uh, around, 40, around 1400, all artists, what we now call artists, were in guilds. For example, the painters were in the pharmacist's guild because it was about chemicals and mixing colors and stuff like that. Um, and they had to work along regulated tariffs. Uh, then there was a new class of um, buyers, art buyers, so to say, of clients, um, that had more money and that weren't necessarily willing to subscribe to those regulated business environment. Um, and in order to escape their guild regulations, the painters and the sculptures and the architects decided we want to step out of the monetary relation altogether. And there was only one institutionally safe way to do that. That was to adhere to the old university and its, um, and its um, disciplines. The old university had three disciplines for making money, medicine, theology, and law. And they had preparations for studying. That was the, how to say, the seven basic uh, disciplines. And they were meant to not make any money. That's why they were called liberal arts. The liberal standing for not making money. Who cannot make money can also be not imposed on regulations on how to make the money. Mm, very obvious. So those painters and sculptors decided we call ourselves artists, liberal artists, in order to escape the regulations. That's why we still call them artists. That's where the term comes from. Uh, for a small, so to say, neoliberal revolution from around 1400. Um, and so there is a certain, how to say, economic, economic twist in the, in the term, ingrained in the term art from the very beginning. Uh, um, and then jump to the museum, but that's okay. Um, the museum is the precondition, one of the preconditions for modernism in the matter that it sets the historical timeline for arts. If you look at the pre-museum collections, and I'm, I'm, I'm only talking about these basic points just to, not to say this is the art history and that's how we have to look at it. That's not the point. The point is to be aware that this is one of very many different possibilities. 
and that we should think we are outside of that box. And we should be aware that this is a box that the art world has been put into at some point, and that one can also leave it. So we have an historical order that was, uh, how to say, imposed on the, uh, through the museum and institutionalized through the museum. And without that institution, it doesn't work. That's actually why we're losing it now, and which may be not even the best, uh, not even the worst thing to lose that historical order. It was a guy called Christian Mechel who first, who first time proposed um, that one should reorder the collections in the, in the, the old treasure collections in an, in a historical mode, and it goes along the what Foucault and also uh, Koselek describe as that, so to say, re grouping of all cultural items that happens between 1770 and 1820. So everything was historicized. All the, all the sciences, all the disciplines, and all the cultural items too. Mm. And the effect of that, and that's the very the, the important thing to know, once you have a historic museum operating along historical terms, the entry point to the museum changes. Mm. If you have a museum that operates on, so to say, uh, quality terms or meritocratic terms or whatever other terms, you have to do something good to enter the museum. You have to do, do a good artist to enter the museum. Once the museum orders, orders the items in an historical mode, you have to produce something new. That's a crucial difference. It makes a big difference. We don't have to, you don't, uh, artists, ever since that, Artists don't have to produce good artworks any longer. That's not the point. Mm? They have to produce new artworks. Mm. And it took, uh, it took quite some time till, the, till that was being understood. Uh, uh, it, uh, when the museums impose that, so to say, that, or, that order, it basically takes two generations of artists to figure out that, this, that there's something to be, to be found there. Um, so um, I think Mechel was, uh, this, is the, this is the sketch of the Vienna Belvedere Museum. That was one of the, fir the first big art collection where he, where he did that uh, schools, basically he was setting up uh, national schools because the, as we know, the, how to say, the, the museums were used to frame culture as a mode of national identity. We're still coping with that. So the, all, the big, all the big state-run institutions that we're having is still built on that initial idea of framing cultures to, in order to create national identity. Um, we're getting also out of that now, but it's like also a slow process. Um, and he basically has the, 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 the different schools of the, the different nations, and, and then, so to say, the overarching order was the, was the national order, and then came the historical order. Italian Renaissance, uh, German Gothic, blah, 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 uh, all of that that we still find in museums. It's still there, it goes back to that. Um, and from that point of view, we have to look at the art market. Um, till 1850, you had a state regulated market system. It wasn't an open market as we had it now. So to say the, the opening that the Renaissance artists created around 1400 was then, the, okay, there's lots of special uh, fields I wants to look into. Dutch, the Dutch art market was something completely different, Tulipomania, you know it, right? um, than the, then the more regulated French art market. So there were different, uh, different we, we cannot get into the details there, but uh, at the, how to say, the core of the globalized art market was then built with modernism. And I would say modernism itself is the conjunction of the logic of the museum and the new art market rising. And one of the crucial moments, it seems like, but I didn't, I'm not so, I, okay, I did a little bit of research into it, but I have the feeling I could do more, just for the lack of time. But one of the crucial moments was when uh, there was the French-German war in 1870, um, lots of artists and the galleries fled Paris and went to London. And in London, they encountered the, a, a new, how to say, client-based, customer base, which were the Americans that lived, that, re that were relocating to London, the early, so to say, industrial, um, industrial oligarchs. And they managed to establish a connection with them. And that's how Paris came to be the capital of modernism. Because then they came back, the Germans, the, the Germans went back to Germany and founded that uh, strange country that is called Germany. <laughs> and uh, the art market went back to Paris. 
So that's the that's the basic, so to say, uh, broad lines, three spots on, on art, of, of art history that one should remember as the as a still operate operative, um, how to say, institutional framework within which we look at art and which in within which we also perform all the how to say artistic ri ar artist rituals, like as in going to an opening or stuff like that. It's all feeds back to that. Um, and then, of course, you have the, um, you have the, 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 how to say, the trajectory of modernism that ends up in, in, in full abstraction and then goes on in some way, random, more or less randomly. Um, well, we don't have to go into, into depth with that, but, because, uh, but you can look at it as a certain recoding of image aspects. The whole, the, the whole modernism was like you were, the, image, the image was being recoded from depicting some outside world to de depicting a time difference of the old and the new image. And of course, the recoding was finished once there was the black square, but then it went on and had, went into different, how to say, uh, tracks. Um, so, the um, situation of the art market changed with the, how to say, with financialization and with the neoliberal state. Uh, these are the next two big steps. Um, the neoliberal state dis dismantled the core institutions of the art and turned them into institutions that were depending on big collectors. Uh, so with that um, dep new dependency came the rise of the curator. The curator in the old museum had the task to cure, as meaning take care of the collection, and nothing else. It was a boring job. Uh, the new curator was, so to say, an agent of temporalization. Realizing actually the museums don't have the financial means to collect all the stuff, so we have to put up temporary <coughs> exhibitions. That's where the influence of the curator rises. You can, if, 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 if I want to phrase it in slightly pejorative terms, it would say the curator is the agent of the temporalization and neoliberalization of the museum. You can call it like that, but it's not necessary to give it that, so to say, negative terms. That was actually something that. I, I did in some articles in Germany that cost me dearly in terms of uh, invitation rates to art institutions. Because, <laughs> of course, after these articles, no curator would ever in invite me to anything. So I was basically self-cancelled self myself very successful in the <laughs> some five years ago. <laughs> I didn't really think it through when before uh, putting up the paper against curating. Um, okay, and it was published in a big German newspaper, so I was out um, there. Um, all, all, uh, despite, uh, all that I'm telling now is, is coming out now in a, in a recent book that I just almost finished and I'm, it's going to, going to be in German, but I put, I'm going to put it on Substack in the, in, 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 uh, at the English version. And I'm going to publish it then with the INC, so it's going to be out also in English. Okay. Um, with, the, with the dependency or with the weakness of the museum, um, the museum got an institution that was more and more depending on uh, the financialized art market. Uh, and basically what we're witnessing now is that most of the, most of the big art shows are basically PR machines for uh, private investment in the arts. Mm? And all that, that, that also affects shows that seemingly look like, uh, like so to say, mm, showing art from Africa or showing art from Asia, whatever, then you look at the details and you figure out that all, those, all, those, all these artists are owned, uh, the, all these artworks are being owned by big galleries in Brazil or in, uh, ever since the artwork, it has, so to say, global extension, uh, extended globally, you also have that, so to say, global art shows that operate exactly in, uh, along the same principles. One of the few exceptions was Documenta last year. And that must be said to the, uh, uh, how to say, um, as it was a remarkable exception. That, uh, and I'm, I'm not so sure whether, it, whether there's a way in, in, in that direction, way out in that direction. I'm, 
I kind of doubt, uh, but okay, one ha would have to look, one, one has to follow that. Uh, I, in, in, as far as I can tell from the situation in Germany, they're closing down that uh, hole now. now. Uh, the, and partially for, re -give, for giving out market influence back, partially for political censorship. Both things, from what I hear, and this is a little bit of an inside information, but um, from what I hear, the, the press re uh, reaction to the last documenta in Germany was that they basically didn't talk about the exhibition, but spoke only about the, uh, how to say, supposedly anti-Semitic works, which is another, is another typical way of German thinking, that you do not really want to accept that in the rest of the world, uh, maybe the, there's different political attitudes, different political judgments, and you think that everybody who wants to show something in Germany should subscribe to the German uh, how to say, a system of values, political values. And, okay, so they were basically slaughtering the documenta. And what I hear now is that they are going to, that they are excluding people from the nominee committee for the next head of the documenta on charges of so-called anti-Semitism, which is basically going through a list of people that were calling for, we have to have an open discourse also about BDS movement, the BDS movement, mm, and they signed that list. They're going through the list, and all, everybody who signed that list has been kicked out. That's how, how to say, cultural freedom is in operation in Germany these days. Mm. Um, just to mention that there's also, we're talking about now very, so to say, art market and all these things, but there's also a new, um, how to say, culture of political repression that uh, we have to, uh, how to say, we shouldn't ignore. Um, okay. Uh, this is something funny that I like to show, but okay, it's a side, it's a side thing. It should have actually come, over, come earlier. It was clear very early to observers of the, the art world that the, how to say, the modernist track would end in full abstraction. Um, Alphonse Allais was basically um, a printer and a bookmaker who made some fun of modernism. And uh, everybody tends to think that Malevich was the first black square. No, it's not true. <laughs> Ale was way before. <laughs> and he was also, if one talks about who was the first really abstract artist, one could include those people. But of course, he's not included. But that's exactly what I'm saying, uh, what I was trying to point out. The art world has been a visual gatekeeping machine for a long time. And it's very clear that a lot of artists are being excluded. And actually, I think that is one of the most important the um, most important task for art history in the coming, in the, in, from, from my perspective, to have figure out, okay, how did these exclusions work? And what was the, what was, what were all the imagery, what was all the imagery that was being excluded by the gatekeeping mechanisms of artists, curators, um, and art historians? And they were strong, they were, so to say, implemented from the very beginning. Whoever didn't subscribe to the rituals that they imposed on visual production was excluded. Um, uh, this is about the, well, it, was, it happens to uh, an out, out, out Basel Miami Beach eternity now, that of course with the rise of the neoliberal state the, the, and the devaluation of the museum, the power of the museum, uh, of the institution of the museum to, main, to maintain the time order, the historical order um, is weakened. Uh, and the most visible sign that we see of that is that we have the modern museums of modern art and we have the museums of contemporary art. Both things are something completely different because contemporary is clearly something that is not historical. The contemporary is always there. Huh? Modernism is historical, contemporary not. And the, 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 basically, the, the name contemporary marks the decline of the historical or historical how to say, historical ordering power of the museum, if one wants to have it like that. Okay. The other thing that was exposed, was imposed by the, by the market relation of, the, of art was the cult of exclusivity. And speaking of a cult, I mean, one can really look at it as a ritualistic cult. Uh, we're not, um, uh, some people have claimed that we're losing the cultic uh, environment in the arts, or uh, how was it, um, Entzauberung, um, Deem, and the, so to say, the, the magic or whatever it was, it was framed. No, we're actually not losing it. It was there all the time. It's right in front of us. It's the, the how to say, the, um, this very strange focus and insistence on objects of exclusivity. 
And you go to any art exhibition, we also go to our ex art exhibition, we still subscribe to that, to, to a certain degree, to that, uh, to that cult, which is a cult of exclusivity, it's a cult of privatization. Mm? And the, format, the standard format of the art work, the, the art work is one of, there's only one single work. Our museums are full of, and our exhibitions, and you go to our press and wherever, there's always that insistence of that this work is only there once. And it's clearly a ritualistic format. Mm? It's, there, there's, for most of the artworks, there's not a technical necessity to have it like that. Um, and modernism, that, that, that is also there's a connection to modernism. Modernism was always described as something progressive just because they operated, so to say, along the, along the timeline of the museum. But technologically seen, is modernism something reactionary and conservative? They conserve production modes of the handmade object. When there was in 1880, 1870, there was a big debate, should we include photography? And they shunned, they, no, the photography was not allowed in the museum for 50 years. And when it was finally allowed, it was only allowed after having found a way to emulate the cult of exclusivity, like numbering each item. Um, with the, together with the, that's why I was asking about, why I was mentioning the, the public, um, together with, the, with modernism was growing the idea that the public doesn't matter, and also the public voice doesn't matter. And this is still very strong in, our, in all our artists' institutions. Basically, art is the only culture, like literally the only culture, where the public has no say in what is being exhibited, like zero. Hmm? And this is a very, this is a very, a very strange, uh, so to say, also effect of that sort of the ritual setup of the art world. And that was actually what, what when when I thought about okay, the, one of the ways out could be to use the institutions to democratize the art world. Um, I'm not so sure whether I'm, not, well, I'm on the right track there because it is, it's a little bit old-fashioned. If I see all those other modes of democratization, also the one, that's some that you mentioned. Um, it's maybe, maybe not the only track, maybe it's not even the right track. If you want to, uh, if you want to, so to say, give the viewers more of a say of what is being exhibited. On, but, okay, if you, how to say, um, the question is, can communities have such a long duration institutional power or do you have to rely on institutions? I would say you have to rely on institutions. So one has to, there's no other way than in order to try to, to, try to change the institutions from within. Um, but it could also be that there is a, that, uh, that uh, out of, so to say, new applications, applications of new media could be, uh, there could be other ways to deal with, uh, with, that, with that issue. Uh, I wouldn't deny that, but uh, one has to think about it, one has to work towards it. So, okay, we can skip that. I mean, just to mention, I didn't show the Duchamps, but I prefer the Sherry Levine that <laughs> demasks it in all masculine, masculist uh, idiocy. <laughs> um, um, so basically, we are, we are, um, we are operating in a system that is dependent on oligarch, that is an oligarch art system, um, where a small class of oligarchs is being deciding what is, uh, what is being shown in 90, 95% of all art exhibitions. Um, and even where they're not actively deciding it, you have, you create an environment in which artists have, in order to make their ends meet, uh, have no other means but to strive into this oligarch art market. So it's always at the horizon, even if you never enter it uh, as an artist. It's always there's the horizon of, ah, maybe once I'm also going to be at Art Basel. Uh, um, Thing um, and of, uh, okay, this is a philosophical detour about um, the Kantian aesthetic. That was all. That was still an aesthetic, a romantic aesthetic imagery where it was about where you had um, how to say interest-free aesthetic pleasure as a as a mode of valuating artworks. And the, the of course the the oligarch market turns it upside down. You have an interest-driven and aesthetically completely indifferent. Uh, um, Indifferent uh, approach to art. Um, 
And there's actually one aspect that I wrote about in, an, in, a, in a paper that I, that I didn't foresee that it would actually, that it would fit that discourse, is the free partition where I was arguing actually for that kind of art is not necessary to be seen or to be, in, to be in exhibited. It's as much as the Kula ring uh, rituals it can be safely stored in some free port and it can also have the same use as in all other, many, very many other artworks that are being traded in that oligarch art market this is for money laundry and all these purposes, which is actually one of the use cases of contemporary art. Um, not the only one though. Mm -hmm. Just to <laughs> and I have a lot, a lot of discussion with friends from, I, no, I, I try to figure out how much of art is actually being used in that uh, modern financialized cooler ring method for, for money laundry. I think the volume, by sheer volume, is not that much. But uh, I, I mean, in all the overall money laundry market is not that much. But inside the art world, I don't know. The, 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 the guesses are between 10 and 50% of the blue chip art market. Hmm. Uh, okay, the, these things don't matter. That's how, you, uh, how the contemporary oligarch art space looks. <laughs> no artworks to be seen. <laughs> um, so the, the tasks are, how do, how, do you want, how do you deal with that situation? Hmm? Uh, and I think the blank, the blank spot is the viewers. And the, the idea is, that is the question that we had. Is, uh, is it uh, you need to go towards revolution or you need to go towards reform? I have a, with revolution. I'm, I'm I'm not so sure. I mean, in political means, maybe yes. In art, in when it comes to art, all those re the, those revolutions were never really revolutions, but were so to say reframing of given institutional practices. Um, and so my hope is kind of that uh, once one can take some institutions of the oligarch settings uh, that their judgment is being balanced somehow. Because right now we have a, we, we have a so to say, herd mentality within, within the oligarch class, oligarch art collectors class that goes, okay, you have, for five years you have post-internet stuff, then you have, uh, queer depictions of uh, living scenarios or of, uh, of modes of life for five years. Then you have a globalized art market that uh, with all, so to say, non-white uh, art, which is all justified. No? I'm not saying anything against that. I mean, uh, especially against the whiteness issue. You know, the white people were dominating the art market for 500 years. It's about time that, um, uh, something else is going on. Now, um, so, so it's just like you are, the, the decision making about what needs to be shown is left to the wrong people. That's what I'm saying. That there needs something else to be shown than uh, white only art, white male only art. That's obvious, no? but uh, the, the, the point is who decides. Um, and I would say the, 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 the crucial point is an institutional empowerment of viewers of art, uh, of beholders, of the spectators. Um, it's just an, there was a, actually, uh, no, there was an early, uh, early modernist, um, modernist drive to ridicule the spectator. And it was very clear in the, uh, when you had uh, the early, early modernism and it was about the uh, replacement of the good art by the new art the indication of what is to be considered new was always that that breaks most the, 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 the most fervently with the aesthetic um, preferences of the of the masters, so to say. That was only that, that, that was always taken as a as an indicator that there's something really new going on. And so there's lots of nice images of uh, Daumier, of all those people that went to the salons in Paris and looked at those things, presented to them, and say and and uh, being so to say ridiculed in their reaction. Mm. Uh, these are the experts at the same time. You had, uh, this, it, it, uh, that's also a certain type of discussion culture in the arts. In, in nowadays arts is basically you cannot discuss artworks. It's impossible. You go to an artist, there is, it's a very strange relation that happened to me that I acknowledge for some, uh, some time. You go to an artist and you say, ah, but you should change that stuff. No way. 
Uh, this is basically, uh, you, you, uh, and it's, uh, we're talking about a ritual uh, relation there. It's a, real, a ritualistic relation that says, by no means any spectator would, can, can, should dare to come up with an idea like that. If you're a writer and you send a text to a, to a journal, they do that all the time. That's normal. Ah, you have changed, you have to change that, that phrase is there, the whole abstract is there, you need to change this. They all go in there and change the whole thing. And I think it goes, it goes back to the same, to the, to the certain realist, uh, ritualistic setting that was born with modernism, that you had, you have to maintain a strict relation between an artist that is, says, can, can do what she, she, he wants, and is being bought by a collector. So that's the only relation that counts. Somebody from the public or somebody from elsewhere to interfere with the creation of the artwork, no. Uh, I'm not saying that it should be like that. I was just asking myself, how come it's like that? Um, okay. Um, I think we were there somehow, but this is a, a theoretical basis of uh, what, what, is, what I think is the re relation of technology to what could be the technology to uh, art and te no, technology to its uses in general, but I'm, I'm just I'm keeping that short. It goes basically my, I was, I was, I was studying with Friedrich Kittler, and there's always that idea of a, of a te technological a priori, which says that technologies are never developed for a certain use. Uh, that would be, uh, but they're there first, and then modes of usage are coming up. Um, it's not technological determinism, like technology doesn't define, doesn't determine what's, what, what uses it's, it's being put to. It's also not technological optimism, like, um, I'm not, or, or accelerationism, those were the two, so to say, other framings of the, of the same thing. But the, the, the metaphor that Kittler used to was a bit typical, very typical German, was like, uh, it's always the misuse of technology that creates the, how to say, that opens the next possibilities. And so basically I would say you have a two-phase uh, a, a two mode of use for technology. And the first phase is always technology emul emulates the old rituals. And I think that's precisely what NFT does. Mm? NFT as a non-functional, non-fungible token emulates exclusivity. Mm. And if one finds a way out of uh, emulating this exclusivity, then, the, then I would say the, the, the NFTs can be brought to, how to say, to a revolutionary or reformist or how you, to, a, to a mode of use that uh, shows, a way, uh, shows a way into, the, into a possible future. Um, but that's also one of the reasons why I was, with the initial use of, uh, of NFTs, I was totally, I, 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 I was actually stunned that, uh, also, all my friends in the Berlin art world were buying into that. It was kind of from the very beginning obvious that it would last two years or six months or three years, and the value would go from zero to whatever speculative heights you have back to zero. Uh, I think that was obvious from the very outset. Um, okay, uh, we were there. Then, uh, to conclude with these, um, with some. I guess it is a, we we're talking about finance, as Gerd pointed out, because finance is, in, uh, in the end, one of the issues that, um, uh, that preoccupies us now. And um, I mentioned yesterday that we were going, that we're going from monetary to fiscal spending, and that has something to do with the war, that has something with the re-empowerment of the state, and that has something to do with the end of the, how to say, low-yield regime that we had for after the finance crisis for some years, um, and this sounds like it doesn't have to, it doesn't have many effects on the art world, but it does, very simple, because um, if you have a low yield environment, um, there is no investment that, how to say, that, uh, the, uh, it makes the art, makes art as an investment more profitable, because there's not so much um, Com, uh, competition for other investments. No? So rich people think, okay, where do I spend my million? Do I, do I earn 5% each year for my million or do I invest it somewhere else? If you're earning 0% anyhow, you can also invest it in art. If you earn 5%, considerable less money will go into art. Mm. Um, 
like on the buyer side, no, on the on the market side. Um, on the other hand, with a, with more fiscal um, with, with more fiscal spending, you have in, you have state-run investment. For now, the state-run investment goes into war, as we all notice. So also the war is somehow connected with what is what could be the future for the arts, because what happened after the last war was that you had the environment of fiscal spending and the fiscal money wasn't necessary for the war any longer. And all of a sudden you had the New Deal and um, um, many of you may know that part of that money went into the arts. So the, uh, part of the FDR uh, uh, Roosevelt deal was uh, to pour some of the money in, uh, state, fund, in, in state funding for the arts. So <laughs> just to <laughs> conclude a little bit like that, let's hope that the war that, the, that all those wars are being most likely lost very soon, and then maybe we're getting back into some type of new deal, which would open another window of funding for the arts. Um, and then the other thing is one could, uh, that I wanted to point out, one could of course turn the whole thing in a, class, in a class struggle mentality and say we are Marxist and we basically want to get rid of the bad oligarchs, but I want to remind us the, 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 those, so to say, Ideas that I'm I'm not buying into the Manichaean idea of the of the of the of the class struggle, like the good and the bad, and I want to remind you that uh, even Marx uh, w cooperated with the good oligarchs, with Engels. Huh? So um, I think it's uh, the point should be rather the attitude towards the oligarchs and the art buyers should rather be. Uh, rather you waste your money on art than on something else. Huh? Uh, so one that one should find a mode of cooperation. And the mode of cooperation could, could, of course, be that every art world, art work, every every art work exists in three should exist in three, so to say, aspects. Um, you may have an original artwork that is being sold traditionally on the market. Why not? Hmm? You may have a, you may have very many copies of this artwork or remixes or whatever whatever forms of cultural appropriation for an artwork that are being encouraged instead of being limited. And NFTs could actually be put to use to track these remixes and to track these reusages of, of art world. And then you have a digital, uh, you would have a digital ima image or whatever digital version of the artwork that can uh, that can and should, um, how to say, um, be available freely. And in that in that sense, you keep so to say you keep, you keep these uh, three formats of one and the same artwork next to each other. And you find a way out of the situation in which we are without a revolution, let's put it like that, with, without dim dismantling everything. Mm. Um, uh, da, da, da. Okay, and then, uh, and then of course, the, 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 one of the crucial ideas is behind that we have to empower the viewer is what is actually, what is it that creates, a, a, how to say, cultural meaning or cultural importance? Uh, and in the art world, in, in, in the, so to say, standard art history, we assume that market prices somehow map, match the cultural value, but it shouldn't be like that. What actually should generate cultural value is the viewer, the appreciation of the viewers. Um, then there's some images of how viewers appreciation <laughs> works. I don't know how, how many of you heard of that instance. There was an old lady, there was a Spanish church in Borja in Catalonia. And an old lady was trying to, a, a, a Christ painting was falling apart. And there was an old lady was, that was taking care of the church. And she was repainting that, the, that painting in a way, you, you see just a little bit of that. Uh, but, but it became an instant internet hit. <laughs> and so people started traveling to Borja in order to make selfies in front of that uh, redone painting. And this is an empowerment of, so to say, the viewer, the, the, art, the viewer as an artist, and the viewer as a viewer. I found that one of the most hilarious aspects of the whole thing. Then I was looking at some shows, I was in New York just now, and it was a little bit about AI, because we know we're going confronted with the next, AI, with the next so to say, wave of technologically induced art world, uh, which is the AI stuff. But I think I talked for long enough, and this is just all the images. There, there's two things. One was a horrible installation of Rafik Anadol in the, in the, at the MoMA, but it was very successful. Basically, you have to imagine this image moves all the time. And there was a nice, very nice criticism about he basically fed all the MoMA archive in an, in an AI <laughs> and turned it into an image that resembles most, uh, like, it resembles a lava lamp <laughs> aesthetically. 
But it worked with the public. It was always full. There was tons of people in front of it. And looking at it, like my daughter spent there half an hour. You could just sit her down. And she was looking at all those, all that. Mm, okay. And then there was the more interesting thing was that there was a lecture in the new museum of three artists that were dealing with AI. And the most interesting that I found was uh, Maya Mann. She did one series of ugly dolls where she threw, threw dolls at an AI and put that back on the internet and got rea the reactions back. So they, basically she installed a feedback loop of using AI, throwing it out to, the, to some, um, I don't know whether it was Instagram, and uh, using that feedback. And that totally made sense to me. So this is the uh, artwork with which I want to finish. <laughs>